Welcome, everybody, to Chapter 16 Review, The South and the Slavery Controversy. This is a picture of slaves returning from the cotton fields in South Carolina. Cotton is king. The cotton kingdom had developed into a huge agricultural factory. In an economic spiral, planters bought more slaves and land. Northern shippers reaped large profits from the cotton trade, and the prosperity of the North, South, and England rested on the bent backs of the enslaved bondsmen. So did the nation's growing wealth. Cotton accounted for half the value of American exports. The cotton export earnings provided capital for the republic's economic growth. The South produced more than half of the world's supply of cotton. About 75% of England's cotton came from the South, and about 20% of England's populace worked in textiles. The Southern leaders knew Britain was tied to them by the cotton threads. This dependence gave the South power, and in the South size, cotton was king. This is the interior of the Cotton Bureau in New Orleans by Edgar Degas, which showed the self-confidence of cotton traders in the pre-Civil War era. The South was a planter aristocracy. In 1850, only 1,733 families owned more than 100 slaves. They were a select group that provided political and social leadership. They enjoyed the lion's share of Southern wealth. They educated their children in the finest schools. Money provided leisure for study, reflection, and statecraft. Most notable was John C. Calhoun, who went to Yale, and Jefferson Davis, who went to West Point. They felt a keen sense of obligation to serve. The dominance by a favored aristocracy was basically undemocratic. It widened the gap between the rich and the poor, hampered tax-supported public education, and idealized feudalism of medieval Europe. The plantation system shaped the lives of Southern women as well. Mistresses commanded sizable household staffs, and the relationships between their mit the mistresses and the slaves ranged from affectionate to atrocious. This is a picture from Courier and, uh, Courier and Ives, which show slaves of both sexes harvesting cotton. Some mistresses showed tender regard for their bondswomen. Some slave women took pride in their status as members of the household, but slavery restrained the bonds of womanhood, and virtually no slaveholding women believed in abolition. The plantation life um, was worrisome, as plantation agriculture became worrisome, distasteful, and sordid because of the despoiled good earth. Quick profit led to excessive cultivation or land butchery. This caused the population to leave for the West and the Northwest in search of more fresh, fertile soil. The economic structure of the South became increasingly monopolistic. The big got bigger and the small got smaller. Financial instability of the plantation system was due to overspeculation in land and slaves. Slaves represented a heavy investment of capital, and an entire slave quarter might be wiped out by disease. The dominance by King Cotton led to dangerous dependence on a one-crop economy. The prices were at the mercy of the world conditions, and the system discouraged healthy diversification. Southern planters resented the North, growing fat at their expense. Cotton King repelled large-scale European immigration. Immigrants added to the manpower and wealth of the North, but not the South. In 1860, only 4.4% of the southern population was foreign-born as compared to 18.7% for the north. German and Irish immigrants to the south were discouraged by competition with slave labor, the high cost of fertile land, and European ignorance of cotton farming. The south became the most Anglo-Saxon part of the United States. Southern life uh, dictated that there were only a handful of southern whites living in Grecian pillared mansions. Only, as we said before, only um, 1,700 or a little over 1,700 families owned 100 or more slaves. Most slave owners had fewer than 10, and smaller slave owners didn't own a majority of slaves but were majority of masters. So these lesser masters were typically small farmers. This is a, a figure that we'll talk about in class uh, that shows slave owning, owning families in the South as of 1850. The white majority. Beneath the slave owners was a great body of whites who owned no slaves. Only one quarter of white Southerners owned slaves or belonged to a slave owning family. Most whites were subsistence food farmers and not part of the cotton export economy. 
The whites without slaves had no direct economic stake in slavery, yet they defended the slave system. They hoped to buy slaves, which was somewhat of an American dream of upward mobility for them. They took pride in presumed racial superiority, and the logic of economics joined with the illogic of racism to buttress the slave system. In the special category of white Southerners were mountain whites. They were independent small farmers who lived in the valleys of the Appalachian Range. They had little in common with the whites of the flatlands. When the war came, mountain whites constituted vitally important, a vitally important peninsula of unionism. They played a significant role in crippling the Confederacy. And then after the Civil War, they were, only concentrated, they were the only concentrated Republican strength in what would become the solid Democratic South. This is a map of Southern cotton production and distribution of slaves, 1820 to 1860, which we'll be talking about in class. And this map as well, Southern cotton production and distribution of slaves, again, in 1820 and 1860. The South's free blacks numbered about 250,000 by 1860. Somewhere in the Upper South, they traced emancipation to idealism or of the revolutionary days. In the Lower South, many were mulattoes. Some, were pur some purchased their freedom, many owned property, and were a kind of a third race. They were banned from certain occupations and vulnerable to being hijacked into slavery. The hostile northern climate, um, the, the, hostile, the northern climate was hostile for free, free blacks also. Several states forbade their entrance. Most denied them the right to vote. Some barred them from public schools. Northern blacks were particularly hated by the Irish immigrants because the two groups competed for jobs. And there was anti-black feeling in ways stronger in the North than in the South. Southern whites liked blacks as individuals but despised their race. Northern whites professed to like race but disliked individual blacks. In the South of 1860, nearly 4 million black slaves were present. The legal importation of African slaves into America ended in 1808 by Congress. Britain abolished the slave trade in 1807. The Royal Navy's West Africa Squadron seized hundreds of slave ships and freed thousands of captives. Yet three million enslaved Africans still were shipped to Brazil and the West Indies after 1807. Slavery in the United States the price of black ivory was so high before the Civil War that thousands of blacks were smuggled into the South. Ironically, the suppression of the international slave trade fostered the growth of a vigorous internal slave trade. Most of the increase in the United States slave population came from natural reproduction. This, was distinct, this distinguished North American slavery from slavery in more disease-ridden, southernly, New World societies. Planters regarded slaves as investments, worth $2 million in capital by 1860. Slaves were the primary form of wealth in the South. They were cared for as any asset is cared for by a prudent capitalist. Sometimes they were spared dangerous work, and slavery was very profitable, even though it hobbled the economic development of the South as a region as a whole. The breeding of slaves was not openly encouraged, but women who bore 13 or 14 babies were prized as rattling good breeders. White masters forced their attentions on female slaves, fathering a sizable mulatto population, most of which remained enslaved. Slave auctions were brutal sites, the most revolting aspects of slavery. Families were separated with distressing frequency. Slavery's greatest psychological horror um, could be seen in separating families. Abolitionists decried the practice as a result, and Harriet Beecher Stowe, in her 1852 novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, shows the, the disastrous nature of slavery and its impact on families. This was a picture of a captive in a net, a slave from the Congo that sits on the shore waiting to be shipped. This is Solomon Northrup, and his autobiography, who was uh, basically taken, kidnapped by slave traders, shipped to New Orleans and sold at auction. And his book became the basis of a major Hollywood film that I'm sure you have seen. This is a um, advertisement for a slave auction. Abraham Lincoln said in 1865, whenever I hear anyone arguing for slavery, I feel a strong impulse to see it tried on him personally. This is a picture of a slave auction as well.
How did the slaves actually live? The conditions varied greatly. Slavery meant hard work, ignorance, and oppression. They had no political rights and minimal protection. Protection laws were difficult to enforce since slaves were forbidden to testify in court or to have marriages legally recognized. Floggings were common, and strong-willed slaves sometimes were sent to breakers who lavishly used the lash to break them. The cruelty of slavery can be shown uh, through devices like this collar with bells used to dis discipline and patrol their slaves. Savage beatings made sullen laborers and hurt resale values. The typical master had too much money invested in slaves to beat them bloody on a regular basis. Blacks were concentrated in the Black Belt of the Deep South by 1860. They stretched from South Carolina to Georgia and into the New Southwest of Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. Frontier life was very harsh. Black living. Most lived on large plantations of 20 or more slaves. In some Deep South areas, the blacks made up 75% of the population. Family life was relatively stable, and a distinctive African-American slave culture developed. There were forced separations um, of families were more common on smaller plantations or in the Upper South. Slaves managed to sustain a family life, and most slave children were raised in two parent households. Family identity continued across generations, and this is dis displaying African culture when avoided marriage between the first cousins, unlike frequent intermarriage of close relatives among the planter aristocracy. African roots were visible in slaves' religion. Many were Christianized during the Second Great Awakening, yet they molded their own distinctive religious forms that mixed Christian and African elements. An African pra practice of responsorial style, responsorial style of preaching was a give and take between the caller and the dancers. This is a picture of a slave nurse and a young white master. Slavery intolerably was degrading to the victims. They were deprived of their dignity and sense of responsibility that come from independence and the right to make their own choices. They were denied an education. These victims of the peculiar institution devised ways to protest. They slowed the pace of labor to the bare minimum. They filched food from the big house. They pilfered other goods and sabotaged expensive equipment. Slaves universally pined for freedom. Many took off as runaways. Others rebelled, though never fully successfully. In 1800, an armed insurrection, insurrection led by a slave named Gabriel in Richmond, Virginia, was foiled by informers, and its leaders were hanged. In 1822, a, a um, famous slave rebellion was led by Denmark Vesey, a free black, who led a rebellion in Charleston, South Carolina, which was also foiled by informers, and Vesey and 30 of the followers were hung. In 1813, Nat Turner, who was a visionary black pe preacher, led an uprising that slaughtered 60 Virginians, and Nat, Nat Turner's rebellion was soon crushed as well. Enslaved Africans rebelled aboard the Spanish slave ship Amistad in 1839. So slavery also affected Southern whites. It fostered the brutality of the whip, bloodhound, and branding iron. They increasingly lived in a state of imagined siege, surrounded by potentially rebellious blacks inflamed by abolitionist propaganda from the North. Such fears bolstered the theory of biological racial superiority. The inhumanity of the peculiar institution caused anti-slavery societies to spring up. Abolitionists and the abolitionist sentiment first stirred during the revolution, especially among the Quakers. Then the American Colonization Society was born in 1817. The idea was to transport blacks back to Africa. In 1822, Liberia, on the West African coast, was established for former slaves. Its capital, Monrovia, is named after President Monroe. There were 15,000 freed slaves that were transported there over four decades. This is a picture of slaves being marched from Staunton, Virginia to Tennessee by Lewis Miller in 1853. Most blacks had no wish to move to a strange civilization after becoming partially Americanized. By 1860, most Southern slaves were native-born African Americans with a distinctive history and culture. Yet colonization appealed to some anti-slaveryites, including Abraham Lincoln, before the Civil War. <laughs>
William Wilberforce was a member of British Parliament and an evangelical Christian reformer who ended slavery in the West Indies. Wilberforce, Wilberforce University in Ohio, an African-American college, later sent many missionaries to Africa. Another abolitionist was Theo Theodore Dwight Weld, who was inspired by the Second Great Awakening and appealed with special power to rural audiences of untutored farmers. Weld also was materially aided by two wealthy and devout New York merchants, brothers Arthur and Louis Tappan. They paid his way to Lane Theological Seminary in Cincinnati, Ohio. He was expelled with several other students in 1834 for organizing an 18-day debate on slavery. Weld and his fellow Lane rebels fanned out a, a, across the Old Northwest preaching the anti-slavery gospel. He assembled a potent propaganda pamphlet called American Slavery as it is in 1839. He had compelling arguments which made it among the most effective abolitionist tracts and greatly influenced abolitionists like Harriet Beecher Stowe when she wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. This is a, a map of early emancipation in the North. This was a tag that identified slaves and free blacks in Charleston. Am I not a brother? Am I not a woman and a sister? This was a popular appeal listing the evil and violence of slavery. William Lloyd Garrison was a radical abolitionist. He was inspired by the Second Great Awakening. He wrote The Liberator, which was a militant anti-slavery newspaper he started in 1831. Under no circumstances would he tolerate poisonous, the poisonous weed of slavery, but he would stamp it out root and branch. The American Anti-Slavery Society was founded in 1833. The founders were William Lloyd Garrison and Wendell Phillips. Black abolitionists also existed and were also radical. David Walker's Appeal to the Colored Citizens of the World, written in 1829, advocated a bloody end to white supremacy. So Yerner Truth fought tirelessly for black emancipation and women's rights. And Martin Delaney was one of the few black leaders who took seriously the notion of mass recolonization of Africa. This is a picture of a plantation that was for sale showing the mansion and then different areas where the slaves would live, the stable, the sugar house, the mill, and then these were the slave cabins. Delaney also in 1859 visited West Africa's Niger Valley seeking a suitable site for relocation. Frederick Douglass is, a, is probably the greatest black abolitionist. He escaped bondage in 1838 at age 21 and was discovered by abolitionists in 1841 after giving an impromptu speech at an anti-slavery meeting in Massachusetts. He continued to lecture despite repeated punishment. He wrote the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, which was his autobiography. This depicted his remarkable origins, his struggle to learn to read and write, and his eventual escape to the North. Garrison and Douglas have similarities but also have differences. Garrison was stubbornly principled and more interested in his own righteousness than in the substance of slavery itself. This is a picture of Frederick Douglass. He repeatedly demanded that the virtuous North secede from the wicked South. He never explained how creation of independent slave republics would end the damning crime of slavery. He renounced politics and he publicly burned a copy of the Constitution as a covenant with death and an agreement with hell on July 4th, 1854. Critics charged he was cruelly pro a cruelly probing moral wound in America's underbelly, but he offered no acceptable balm to ease the pain. Frederick Douglass was flexibly practical. He and other abolitionists increasingly looked to politics to end slavery. He backed the Liberty Party in 1840, the Free Soil Party in 1848, and the Republican Party in the 1850s. Most abolitionists, including Garrison, followed the logic of beliefs and supported war as the price of emancipation. This is a picture of Sojourner Truth, who was also a female abolitionist. The anti-slavery sentiment still existed in the South. In the 1820s, there were more anti-slavery societies south of the Mason-Dixon line than north of it. After 1830, the Southern abolitionism was silenced. 
the Virginia legislature debated and defeated various emancipation proposals in 1831 and 1832. This marked a turning point. This is where the slave states begin to tighten what's called slave codes and banned emancipation of any kind, voluntary or compensated. Nat Turner's rebellion in 1831 caused hysteria throughout the South. Garrison bitterly condemned it as a terrorist, condemned him as a terrorist and inciter of murder, although he was unconnected with the rebellion. The state of Georgia was offered $5,000 for Garrison's arrest and conviction. The nullification crisis of 1832 further implanted fear in the southern white minds. Jailings, whippings, and lynchings greeted rational efforts to discuss the slavery problem in the South. Pro-slavery whites responded by launching a massive defense of slavery as if it was a positive good. They claimed that the master-slave relationships resembled those of a family. They were quick to contrast the happy lot of their servants with overworked northern wage, wage slaves of the factories. And pro-slavery arguments widened the chasm between the South and the North. The controversy increasingly limits free speech and the gag resolution is pushed through Congress by the Southerners. This required that anti-slavery appeals were going to be tabled without debate, so you couldn't even speak about slavery in Congress. Southern whites resented the use of mail for abolitionist literature also. Congress ordered that Southern postmasters had to destroy any abolitionist material, and they called on Southern states to arrest postmasters who did not comply. These were all limitations of free speech. The abolitionists, especially Garrisonians, were unpopular in the North. The Northerners revered the Constitution and saw its clauses on slavery as a lasting bargain, and the ideal of the Union had very deep roots. The North had heavy, a heavy economic stake in the South as well. Southern planters owed Northern bankers and creditors about $300 million, which would be lost if the Union dissolved and the disruption to the slave system might cut off a vital supply of cotton to northern mills and thus bring unemployment. Abolitionists often suffered violent attacks. They had influenced northern opinion by the 1850s, and many had come to see the South as a land of unfree and a home of a hateful institution. But few were prepared to abolish slavery outright, but a growing number of, a growing number of people opposed extending it into the western territories. This is the world's anti-slavery convention in London in 1840. This is a comparative abolition of slavery table, which shows the countries and the dates that slavery was abolished in each one. This is in defense of slavery. In this first illustration, it shows a benevolent slave regime of the South and showing that the slaves are well cared for and are treated as a family. This illustration supposedly shows the harshness of working life in New England where starvation wages and unemployment blighted the workers' lives. This is the chronology from the chapter. <laughs> 